This is Popular Front, a podcast focused on the very niche and kind of geeky details of modern warfare with me, Jake Hanrahan. Today we're speaking to Hans. He'd rather go by his alias rather than his real name. He's going to be talking about the Chaldean, Assyrian and Syriac community in Iraq, Syria and the rest of the Middle East, which often get miscategorized as just Christian militias. Hans is going to explain why that's not particularly accurate and also about how they've contributed to the war effort in the fight against ISIS. Because the situation is so complicated, the first 10 minutes will be a little bit different. It will just be Hans describing the differences between Assyrians, Chaldeans, Syriacs, and then it will jump off into the proper podcast. This episode is sponsored by DefensePost.com. If you want Popular Front exclusive bonus episodes, go to patreon.com slash popularfront. Terms Iraqi Christian, Syrian Christian, or worst of all, Kurdish Christian get tossed about. Um, well, the people in question are certainly Christian, and faith and church life often plays a central role in the community. Falling back on this kind of macro sectarianism erases crucially important aspects of ethno national identity. Um, I think one of the biggest problems for outsiders and newcomers is the fact that you have to grapple with like half a glossary's worth of names in order to even get your bearings straight. Uh, this is a perennial source of frustration for unity-minded members of the community itself, too. So you have Assyrian, you have Syriac, you have Chaldean, Aramean, then the five main churches, and so on. It's a lot even setting aside like the non-English terminology that you're going to encounter. Um, some folks try to make things easier for themselves by trying to regard each of these labels as being like a definitive, bounded, totally separate entity. Um, but the truth is that this approach doesn't really hold up when you start looking at the interconnections and shared histories that these various like subcommunities have. Um, but one uh, substantive distinction, which I think is not really understood or discussed well enough by people in the West, uh, relates not to church affiliation or even political definitions of nation, but to uh, geography. So before the, the 1915 genocide, the Seifo, uh, Year of the Sword, as it's called, uh, the inhabited homeland of the indigenous people of Betnahrin, uh, Mesopotamia, encompassed uh, encompassed a blotchy archipelago from what is now like south southeast Turkey to northwest Iran and northern Iraq. Uh, historically speaking, these areas are the last readouts of the great Aramaic speaking empires of antiquity, chiefly among the Assyria, which used to encompass much of the Levant, Mesopotamia, and Anatolia before being reduced by successive conquests and massacres. Uh, so within this general area, there was a lot of like local diversity of language of customs, but you can kind of draw a general east west distinction. Uh, many Westerners call themselves Suryoye or Othoroye. Uh, Easterners use Suraye or Atoraye. You can see how these terms are pretty similar. Uh, the dialects spoken by each of these groups stem from a common northeastern Neo Aramaic classical Syriac source, but have limited mutual intelligibility nowadays. Uh, Westerners concentrated in the areas of Diyarbakir, Omid, uh, the Tarabdin Plateau, and a few villages directly below Mardin in the plains. Uh, most of them were and still are adherents of these Syriac Orthodox and Syriac Catholic churches, but there were also a handful of Chaldean villages amongst them converted from the Church of the East. Uh, Easterners, on the other hand, lived in areas from Urmia through to the Hakkari Highlands and then south into the Nineveh Plains uh, with a few enclaves further south in Iraq. Uh, originally uh, from the Church of the East, um, many communities were converted to the Chaldean Catholic Church after it was uh, created during a lengthy dispute over patriarchal succession, which kicked off in the mid 16th century. Basically, Rome was trying to take over the spiritual leadership of the Eastern Assyrians, as they were often called at the time. Um, and it's led to a whole chain of uh, issues uh, within the community. Uh, to make things even more complicated, there are also a substantial number of Syriac Orthodox and Syriac Catholic adherents amongst Easterners. Um, so with that as kind of the background, we'll go into the national labels, which one finds competing in the modern era. 
the first national movement to take off promoted a common Assyrian identity. Uh, this definition, which does have substantial historical evidence behind it, declares unbroken continuity across millennia between the modern Assyrian communities and the ancient Assyrian Akkadian polities originating in northern Mesopotamia. This movement has drawn leadership and popular support, support across all sects and both regional communities. Uh, although it is sometimes identified most closely with the Eastern communities, particularly those originating in Hakkari and the churches of the East. Uh, that would be the mainstream Assyrian Church of the East and the ancient Church of the East, which split off in the 1960s over a dispute in church leadership uh, revolving around the update for, uh, to the Gregorian calendar from the old Julian calendar. Uh, you'll occasionally see the term Nestorian used for the Church of the East, especially in historical texts, although many Assyrians today view this as pejorative because uh, it implies a kind of heretical theology. Uh, I'm not much of a theologian, so I'm not going to try to explain this further, but it's just a term to be aware of. Um, the other two main definitions, Chaldean and Syriac, emerged somewhat in opposition to the Assyrian identity. Uh, this division is often promoted problematically by church leadership and tacitly supported by the clientele politics of the states and quasi-states of the region who would rather deal with well-atomized minorities. Certain outside analysts and onlookers sometimes fixate on these as though they were definitively bounded and separate entities, whether due to some kind of condescending academic fixation on sectarianism as being the ultimate essence of the Orient, or due to weirder championing, championing abstract theology over organic community. Uh, so Chaldeanism roots itself in, of course, uh, the adherence of the Chaldean Catholic Church. Uh, in antiquity, the Chaldean people uh, hailed from southern Mesopotamia and really didn't have a whole lot to do with people in the north. Um, the most ecumenical logic behind the term holds that because like the last Babylonian dynasty to rule in Mesopotamia, uh, the, they called themselves Chaldean, and so this term should thereby encompass all Mesopotamian Christians. Um, but true to the church's origins and that whole succession dispute with the Church of the East, uh, promoters of this identity today are often particularly hostile to Assyrianism. Uh, a good number of Chaldean Catholics do, however, identify as Assyrian, uh, and it's even fairly common for there to be both Church of the East and Catholic adherents within the same families. Uh, Chaldeans, geographically speaking, are by and large Easterners, though a few do hail from Tur Abdin in the West as well. Uh, Syriac identity is uh, held by substantial sections of adherents of the Syriac Orthodox and Syriac Catholic churches. There are some Eastern communities included, like those of Bakhtida and Bartela in the Nineveh Plains, uh, but the identity, as it's known nowadays, is probably most closely associated with uh, the Western communities originating in Tur Abdin, Mardin, and uh, Diyarbakir. Um, there are also a handful of villages in western Syria with inhabitants belonging to the Syriac churches, particularly around Homs, uh, but they've for a long time now been fairly assimilated into the surrounding Arabic-speaking landscape. Uh, the term Syriac obviously is not dissimilar to Assyrian uh, and is indeed sometimes referred to all dialects of the language as it's spoken today, um, both in everyday speech and the liturgical language. Um, but rather than focusing as much on northern Mesopotamia, that is historic Assyria, as the ultimate heartland, this definition uh, has a bit more to do with the Levant to the west, historical Syria. Uh, in a maximal definition, Syria can even extend to encompass the Maronites of Lebanon, who also use uh, classical Syriac as their liturgical language to this day. Uh, a closely related identity movement here to Syriac is uh, Arameanism, uh, which sets itself a little more militantly against Assyrianism by claiming ultimate descent from the ancient Arameans of what is now Western Syria, and whose settlement did extend a ways across the Euphrates at times. Uh, this definition could also encompass the uh, tiny Western Aramaic-speaking enclave of Malula, north of Damascus, whose <laughs> Christians are ironically actually adherents of the Antiochian and Melkite churches, which have like a Greekish origin. Um, 
Historically speaking, though, it's actually kind of hard to totally disentangle Assyrian and Aramean as there was considerable linguistic and cultural fusion and exchange between the two after the Assyrians conquered the Levant and began to adopt Aramaic as their lingua franca. So if uh, I'm going to be made to pick sides here, I think that the Assyrianist movement probably has a better case on balance, but I also do understand the reality that the other definitions are genuinely supported by a good many people. Uh, so I think the best approach for now is to really emphasize that these groups, however they define themselves, constitute a unified if, dif if differentiated whole, as any nation does, and to try to foster understanding of this. Uh, the major political movements, uh, a lot of them employ like this neutral, if cumbersome, catch-all, Syriac, Assyrian, Chaldean, Aramean, all in one breath, um, even if the movements themselves do have stronger positions behind one definition or the other. Uh, and when I'm talking about the communities in northeast Syria, um, Jazeera, Gozarto, I will use Syriac and Assyrian separately, oftentimes, as in the local historiography, they generally refer respectively to distinct Western and Eastern communities who settled in the area after the Sifo, um, but the implicit understanding is that these are parts of a whole. Um, and although, again, I do feel that the term Christian is not sufficiently descriptive or sensitive to the very real national question, as I've outlined here, um, I will sometimes say it when it's already understood that I'm talking about Assyrian Syriac Chaldeans on the whole, or where it's also necessary to include neighboring groups like Armenians in consideration. Um, and just as kind of like a fun little footnote, uh, due to missionary activities of the Church of the East uh, centuries ago, there is actually um, a community in southern India uh, using Syriac as a liturgical language, which does fall within the broader definitions of uh, at least a church-based identity. Apologies, there was a problem with the sound on my mic. The Syria is a land in the same way that Kurdistan is kind of a land, right? It's spread out through these different areas and it's not official or recognized or in control of the people themselves. Yeah, and it's, it's due to, um, you know, genocide, massacres, uh, and general emigration. It's a lot more of an archipelago than contiguous Kurdistan is today. But it's, it's, it's a similar sort of thing. You know, these are the people that have been living on those lands since, you know, time immemorial, really. You know, as time progressed, uh, the issue came up that, uh, you know, this nation is uh, divided between a number of churches uh, who have a long and storied history of kind of feuding amongst one another. I've seen people in Iraq kind of laughing about all oh, the, the Christian militias, you know, the, the, like the MPU, the Nineveh Plains Protection Units. It's like, well, actually, this, there's a long history behind this. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about, about that. When did their fight kind of start? So, yeah, you know, the next layer of, uh, you know, complexity is the political scene. Nowadays, um, I would say in Syria, Northeast Syria, Gozarto, as, as it's called, Jazeera, um, Dauranoia are the, um, dominant movements. And what is that? So it's actually one of the more recent arrivals on the political scene here, uh, formed in the, uh, late 80s to early 90s, um, bridging, uh, the diaspora communities, uh, largely in Germany, um, with the re remnant, uh, community in uh, Tur Abdin, um, so southern Turkey. Um, they formed a uh, militia uh, known by its acronym the GHB, um, Mesopotamian Revolutionaries Party, something like that, um, which uh, had a number of uh, clashes actually with KDP Peshmerga in northern Iraq. And for what reason did the GHB form in the first place? Um, so on the one hand, you had the growing PKK insurgency uh, in the southeast of Turkey, um, which due to the historical overlap between the um, Assyrian Syriac and Kurdish communities, um, you know, the fight was brought to, um, you know, the doorsteps of uh, the community in Tarabdin, so to speak. You know, at the same time, the PKK was fighting for a revitalization of language and culture and identity. Um, 
and a number of people found this kind of an appealing model. The, the Syriacs of Tur Abdin, you know, those who were getting involved in this, the, in the Daranoi movement, you know, kind of felt that, you know, the PKK model would be beneficial to, you know, reviving their own sense of community. So they basically saw the PKK fighting and rising up for the Kurds and thought, yeah, we want some of that. We should probably do the same. Yeah, uh, more more or less, um, and there were you know there were contacts between uh, the PKK and the Daranoia. Yeah, I've seen photos where they're kind of in I don't know if they're joint operation rooms or whatever they are, but they seem to be quite close, you know, training together. Yeah, yeah, some um, Daranoia guerrillas did you know embed within PKK units, um, and you know Daranoia's own militia had its own actions, and if you look at the videos, they're dressed in you know your standard issue guerrilla clothing. Um, but with Urchelan's capture in 99 and the kind of flux that the PKK went into, uh, Daranoia also kind of, uh, you know, went into disarray for a little bit. Um, but lagging a little bit behind um, the, the KCK in the early 2000s, they started to build themselves back up. Um, and this is when you see the foundation of the Syriac Union Party in both Syria and Lebanon, um, which would become very important later on when the civil war went live in Syria because the SUP in Syria um, became the uh, first really inter-ethnic coalition partner of the PYD and gave rise to the Sutoro, the MFS. And they are the militias, right? The Syriac, Syrian militias fighting currently in northern Syria mostly. Yes, uh, with one kind of special case um, exception for the villages on the Khabur. So, yeah, you know, at the same time that, you know, the PKK, KCK was looking to broaden its organizing activities beyond just focusing on Bakur, so founding, you know, PJAC, founding PYD, uh, the Daudanoia were also looking to increase their own regional footprint. It's kind of an obscure period, um, but, you know, they largely rooted themselves in um, the... Uh, Syriac community in uh, northeast Syria um, seemed to actually have, interestingly, a firmer base in some of the more uh, provincial areas in the rural villages and small towns, um, whereas uh, the more urban you get, the more pro-regime you get within the uh, Syriac community there. You know, it's actually interesting. Um, before, you know, everybody knew the MFS uh, as, you know, being, you know... That's the, the Syriac Military Council, right? Yes. They're, they're, what would you say, they're the biggest kind of Syriac uh, militia out there fighting in Syria? Yeah, yeah, I, I, would, I would say that. So, uh, you know, before, you know, they came to be known as the, you know, partner of the Yepige, um, their formation was actually declared, I think, in January 2013 or so, um, where they declare themselves to be um, an anti-regime militia, which is actually very interesting in the context of the broader cr Christian community in Syria. Yeah, because a lot of the Assyrians and Syriacs I kind of see online and that are quite pro-Assad. Yeah, yeah, and that's, you know, a really common posi position, and it's understandable to an extent in that, uh, you know, the regime has always sought to position itself as kind of the guardian of minorities against, um, you know, predatory Islamism on the one hand, and also, um, you know, maximalist Kurdish nationalism, uh, which due to the memory of the 1915 genocide is kind of a really potent force uh, in the community. Because the Kurds helped in that, right? I mean, there's no escaping that history. Majorly, I would say, especially in the case of Syriacs, Assyrians, um, and also to a large but lesser extent with the Armenians. I think it was either 2011 or 2012, um, SUP members in Sweden actually stormed the Syrian embassy in protest of the Assad regime. Um, and so early on, actually, they were trying to stake out um, this really kind of radical um, anti-authoritarian uh, position. 
um, which, you know, given the fact that the pro-rebel environment really was never suitable to take on this kind of diversity, that did not take root there. So they kind of forced their hand to make their own militia, essentially. Yeah, yeah. They, you know, they, they even had kind of pipe dreams of organizing in uh, Syriac Orthodox, Arabic-speaking largely communities in Aleppo and Homs as well. Yeah, I imagine that was a, a very slow start up, especially in those areas at that time. So which, which, which town did they start up in? So their, their initial, uh, the MFS's initial video uh, was kind of one of these, you know, very stereotypical rebel foundation, you know, nondescript room, bunch of masked guys with guns reading out a statement. Could be Aleppo, could be in the Northeast, um, but... Could be Germany. Yeah, could be Germany too. <laughs> um, but uh, really when you start to see them coming above ground as a substantial, you know, meaningfully connected force was, you know, as they were, you know, entering in with their old friends in uh, PYD, um, in the northeast, when you started to see the Sutoro uh, pop up. Sutoro are like a Syrian, what, like uh, military police? Yeah, basically, gendarmerie. You know, kind of the equivalent to the Kurdish Asayish. They, there's this whole kind of, you know, trinity of field military, military police, and political party, which is, you know, replicated in various ways across the north now. Um, but so the Sutoros first popped up in Derik in uh, Cabre Huore, uh, so Tervespie, Carthania in the Bathurst terminology, and in Kamishli, uh, which that particular branch ended up taking a kind of a uh, unique trajectory, we'll say. Yeah, how does that work? Because, I mean, you have YPG, Asayish, you have the regime there as well, and then they got Satoru. How did that work? So, um... In, in the other two towns, you know, Sutoro came up and, you know, under the ideological framework of the uh, PYD, Apogee ideology, like it's really no problem for, you know, a community to have its own, you know, specifically organized militia so long as they're like down with the program. So that, you know, took off, was perfectly fine. However, in Kamishli, due to the presence of the uh, regime there, uh, things kind of took a turn for the worse. Um, basically, pro-regime elements, uh, you know, twisted SUP's arm into agreeing to having that city's branch of the Sutoro under um, a, basically like an advisory board of various, you know, quote unquote, civil society organs, um, and not just, you know, being SUP's project. Um, so that, that's like a bullshit way of them just going, you can set up shop here, but you do what we say. Basically, it, what it turned into was, you know, the quote unquote civil society wing of it uh, was very quickly taken control of by pro-Damascus elements. Uh, a schism occurred, um, which in my opinion is actually one of the more ridiculous things to have happened during the war. Um, the Kamishli Sutoro rebranded itself as the Sutoro. So uh, the pro regime, you know, basically crypto NDF, Sutoro, S O O T O R O. Uh, whereas the, you know, actual original uh, SUP project is S U. T-O-R-O. -O. And, you know, the, the funny thing is that this isn't something that even really, like, transposes, like, into, you know, Arabic or into Syriac. Like, this is a distinction which um, revolves around English transliteration. And the Sutoro uh, likes to claim itself as being the original thing, but that's, that's really nonsense. So you have two wings of essentially... Syrian, Syriac, military police, they get split, they have the same name, one is loyal to the regime via various militias, you know, like you said, the NDF, and then one is still uh, loyal or still a part of the MFS. Yeah, it, it's like the police counterpart to the MFS. And uh, uh, SUP um, actually had to, like, go back to Kamishli and, like, refound its own uh, SU Toro, um, we'll say. And there have been some frictions in the past, like a SUP Sutoro member was uh, 
kidnapped by a regime police in, I think, like, 2014 or so and beaten. Um, and that was a whole fracas. And then occasionally, uh, Asayish clashes with Sutoro or GPF, as they have been half rebranded since 2015. And that's the Sutoro that's loyal to the regime. Yeah, so basically, GPF, Gozarto Protection Forces, um, it's not a distinct militia from the Sutoro, S-O-O, -O, as far as anybody is really aware. Um, it's just kind of a question of, like, stickers. Um. Sure. And, and how, how did MFS kind of come about as a military force? Because from what I understand, they're actually a serious force, um, good fighters. You know, they, were, they eventually became part of the SDF. Um, how did that happen? Where do they get their arms? You know, how do they train their fighters? Uh, so, as far as where they get their arms, I'm assuming they're getting them from more or less the same channels as where the Yepige does. Um, I know, as of late, uh, you know, when the U.S. coalition had been, you know, we're only arming the Arabs, um, and then, oh, we're now arming the Kurds, the MFS were actually... Uh, petitioning to be like, hey guys, we also exist, can you give us weapons too? I don't know if that's panned out. So, as I was saying earlier, you know, the formation video cropped up kind of out of nowhere in like early 2013, nothing really came of it. Um, but then it re-emerged again at the end of 2013 in the first Yepige offensive on Tal Hamis, uh, which is a large rural Arab village south of Kamishli. Um, the offensive ultimately did not go very well for the Yepige. Um, they suffered a couple dozen casualties as a result of letting civilians back in too soon, uh, containing sleeper cells who ambushed Yepige from behind. ISIS sleeper cells, right? Yeah. Well, ISIS and also just kind of like mixed jihadi rebel uh, to include Nusra. Uh, this was, you know... At Jihadi the, Inc. Yes, basically. At, this was, like, just before the dawn of the Great Fitna, by which ISIS took control of the entire East. But MFS uh, first cropped up here, manning some checkpoints uh, in the villages south of Tal Maruf. So, so did they fight with the YPG in that offensive? They weren't on the front lines to begin with, but I do think they saw some action as the Yepige began retreating after, um, you know, being ambushed. Um, and all of a sudden, the people who were manning the checkpoints now have to, you know, pitch in to fight as well. From then on, they started to take more roles in, um, you know, Yepige fights. Like in mid-2014, actually, they... Uh, as the operation to secure the corridor to Sinjar happened, uh, MFS uh, participated in battles uh, at the uh, Telkocha border crossing and also reportedly um, for the Sinjar corridor itself. But I, I would say that their really first major engagement came um, in early 2015. Uh, so the backdrop of this is that uh, Yepige was going for Tal Hamis again, and this time it was coming with, uh, you know, airstrikes, um, and it was really, you know, Peshmergish helping them by shelling across the Iraqi border, uh, and they were really kind of bearing down on this very crucial uh, northern hub uh, for ISIS. And why, why is it so crucial? Can you explain? Or was it so crucial? Uh, so it was part of the whole infrastructure which allowed for uh, ISIS to surround and storm Sinjar. Um, it was their main base of operations for trying to attack, you know, Kamishli and, um, you know, trying to push back again to the Talkocha border crossing. Uh, so, you know, if you take Tal Hamis, you ba it's basically, you know, lights out for uh, ISIS to be able to conduct any real ground actions in uh, Upper Jazeera. Sure. There's a perfect crossroads to be based at, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it was like a, you know, a slave trafficking hub for them and everything. And the local population was, you know, complicit to a degree in this. And um, 
But so Yepige was bearing down very hard on this and, you know, strategically thinking, uh, you know, ISIS was you know, like, okay, we're not having a lot of success uh, pushing back on this front. How are we going to, uh, you know, turn the tides in our favor? What do they usually do? They pick a particularly vulnerable, vulnerable area somewhere nearby and attack that. Uh, and this in this case happened to be the string of um, Assyrian villages um, along the Khabur River uh, between uh, Ras Alain and Hasaka. And this kind of gets into the uh, next dimension of uh, Syriac Assyrian matters in the Northeast. Most of the Christian population in the Northeast uh, are Syriac Orthodox with a historic uh, and dwindling uh, Syriac Catholic minority, uh, originally from uh, like Tur Abdin and Mardin and the villages um, on the plains directly below that plateau who were, uh, who fled into uh, Jazeera during the 1915 genocide, uh, the Saifo, and where during the 1920s and 30s set up by the French as kind of their uh, preferred group in the new urban centers that were springing up prior to the 20s, uh, Jazeera was just, you know, nomad dominated plain. So, you know, the French had this very conscious policy that they were going to tame and civilize this, you know, agriculturally productive area and you know, their model citizens in this case were uh, Christians, also including some Armenians uh, who were fleeing the genocides. But in the 1930s, um, a separate wave of Christians of different regional origin came in. Uh, so these people were originally from the Hakkari area in the extreme southeast of Turkey, um, predominantly members of the Church of the East with a Chaldean Catholic minority speaking the Eastern dialects. Uh, they fled into northern Iraq during the time of the genocides, um, but found that uh, it wasn't exactly the most welcoming place for them. Um, so in 1933, I believe, um, the Simil massacre occurred. Uh, basically, Iraqi Arab and some Kurdish uh, military units uh, began attacking uh, these refugees, uh, seeing them as kind of loyal to colonial projects or something like that. Just because they were Assyrian, essentially, or Syriacs. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you know, the, the colonial powers did try to organize amongst these people, as said, but there's also deeper currents of religious and, you know, really communal hatred that came out there. And so a branch of the people who were attacked fled across the Tigris River into French Syria. Um, and there was this whole process, like, what are we going to do with them? They were planning to maybe, like, clear out some land in West Syria and settle them there, but they didn't have the money to do that. Uh, so basically, they left them to found villages in the refugee camps that they had um, established on the uh, Khabur River um, on lands expropriated from the Chechen and English minority, actually. You know, this, is, this community has, a, you know, very different history from the rest of the scene there. They speak a different dialect. They're members of different churches. Um, they seem to have been scattered amongst the cracks amongst the already fractured region. You know what I mean? It seemed really niche in some of the areas they've had to kind of slip into to escape various, you know, attacks. Yeah, and so, you know, this string of villages very literally became um, a fault line. On the Kabul River. Yeah, uh, yeah, in early 2015. Um, so as, as the regime had been withdrawing in 2012 to 2013 um, to the urban centers of Haska and Kamishli, they kind of left the local populations to their own devices. Um, and so the Assyrians on the Kaba River 
uh, established their own basically local defense force independent of really everything else. You know, this is a bunch of like, you know, guys who grab their, you know, hunting rifles or their weapons from military service and just kind of drummed up a little militia there. They had some isolated clashes with rebel groups who were trying to infiltrate the area. Uh, but then in late 2013, Yepige kind of cleared those out and they entered into this really weird, like, uh, parallel existence thing. Uh, Yepige, perhaps uh, deferring to uh, communal sensitivities and realizing that, you know, installing a Kurdish militia permanently to... Uh, occupy these Assyrian villages would not really be the best PR. Uh, kind of left the Kabur guards, the local defense militia there to just run their own scene there. So they kind of, they've scooped out the rebels that were attacking them, but they kind of just went, okay, you do your thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, at the same time, uh, MFS kind of was wanting to unify all of the uh, Syriac Assyrian communities in the Northeast under their banner to have a better, you know, united front. Uh, but, you know, in part due to these kind of parochial sensibilities of the Kabul community, they were not really down with that. So, so they, so the Kabul guards would, they're still their own entity, right? They didn't fall under MFS. Yes. Why, why would you mean by the, the kind of parochial thing? Because I mean, it would sound... If I had a little group, I'd be like, yeah, I'll join you guys. So why do they decide not to? I think in significant part, this again revolves around like the national identity question. Um, so Daudanoia, um, they started out kind of very explicitly not taking a position on the national question and trying to organize amongst all the communities. Um, but after the early 2000s, they kind of settled back into what, you know, their original base tended to identify as, which is Syriacs. And so they have that sort of aesthetic. On like the, the church level, uh, in the 2000s, the Syriac Orthodox Church dropped a brand new cathedral on the Chabo River, despite the fact that literally none of them are Syriac Orthodox. They're either Church of the East, Ancient Church of the East, or... Chaldean Catholics, with most of them being Assyrian Church of the East. Uh, and so they're kind of like, you know, why are you trying to, like, proselytize amongst us? So there's kind of a suspicion. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So they're kind of the same community in terms of, like, Assyrian Syriac Chaldeans, but in terms of beliefs, quite different. And it sounds like one is kind of pushing on the other a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can kind of think about it like you have... Yeah, maybe not as divergent as, like, Scots and English, but maybe, like, you know, Bavarians and Northern Germans, you know, something like that. Um, you know, where there is this kind of, you know, genuinely held uh, local and regional uh, identity, which uh, there are fears that, you know, it may be subsumed under this other identity and they want certain protections for that. Um, but... You know, MFS was, you know, even willing to start broadening its, uh, you know, branding to include more uh, Assyrian uh, representation. Um, so nowadays, actually, there's a kind of a weird, like, partial custody arrangement um, where MFS kind of, like, acts as a steward of the Chabur guards, but they still have their own structures and do their own things and send their own delegations to the front. Um, but that really kind of coalesced after the battles on the Chabur. Chabur guards had also been kind of trying to, like, take this neutral path with regards to ISIS, and that was probably not the best idea, to be quite honest. Yeah, it sounds like a bad one. How do you mean neutral? They kind of they wanted to just ignore it or avoid it or what? So, yeah, you know, ISIS had, you know, rooted itself in the Arab communities to the south, uh, so around Mount Abdulaziz, um, and uh, were starting to kind of, like, push a little bit on the Assyrian villages. Um, and they demanded that, you know, the crosses be taken down from the churches and uh, no more church bells can ring and things like that. Um, MFS had been starting to try to organize in these villages at the same time and kind of came back in and put the crosses back up. Um, and 
you know, as ISIS was getting rolled back around Tal Hamis, they decided to, you know, spring their counteroffensive into the Khabur. And due to this, you know, really weird, you know, parallel security arrangement that had developed there, you know, the Khabur guards were in no condition, you know, in terms of their fighting ability, their numerical strength to really fend this off. ISIS took, you know, a whole swath of the villages, kidnapped over, uh, you know, 200 civilians, ended up executing a couple of them. You know, MFS, you know, first jumped into the trenches, lost a number of martyrs, and then Yepigek, you know, saw what was going on. You know, ISIS was starting to, like, probe, you know, even past the Assyrian villages into some of the Arab countryside uh, surrounding, and, you know, Yepige was, you know, enough is enough, we're stepping in here. From February through, you know, April, the process began of, you know, rolling back what ISIS had done here. You know, this is where you see uh, one of the first international martyrs of the uh, MLKP, the one of the Turkish Communist Parties, Ivana Hoffman. Marxist-Leninist Communist Party. Yeah. So, you know, this, you know, really interesting historical moment where you see a black German communist fall martyr defending um, a small Middle Eastern Christian minority in Northeast Syria. Whilst fighting for a Turkish slash Kurdish far left militant group is nuts, man. This is really, it's a real, I guess that kind of uh, personifies a lot of the fights uh, that happen around these little, you know, villages and smaller, lesser known kind of ethno states, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, eventually, at, I think over 80 martyrs in total, which was a pretty steep price to pay um, for the offensives of the time, uh, ISIS was finally expelled uh, 2015, so uh, February to April. Um, but most, the overwhelming majority of the population had fled. Um, a lot of them are still abroad and don't really have plans to come back anytime soon. Unfortunately, although ha there has been some return going on, villages were left in ruination as a result of, you know, combat, as a result of airstrikes, as a result of looting, not only by ISIS, but also, you know, there is some charges leveled at Yepige and MFS. As good as work as they do out there, I think a lot of people like to pretend that bad things never happen amongst these groups, which... Obviously they do, you know, it's a war, shit happens, it's bad. I'm kind of of the mind that, you know, if you get a bunch of, you know, you know, young men from the village, give them guns and a bit of power and send them into somebody else's homes, it's like, ah, you know, my family could use a new refrigerator. Uh, and so they, they pinch that and it becomes a problem because, you know, what if the people who own that refrigerator want to come back and use it? Very bad optics as well. It's the first thing people say. Oh my God, they're looting. It does, of course, it's terrible. It, it actually ended up blowing up to become a huge issue because the then commander of the Khabar Guards, uh, David Jindo, um, who in the time leading up had actually been, you know, singing the praises of democratic confederalism in, you know, pro-PYD circles and was, you know, looking to start integrating his community more closely with the growing Federalist project, um, he started to speak up against the looting that was going on, and he turned up dead on the side of the road. His second-in-command, oh, gravely wounded beside him, uh, his second-in-command, Elias Nasser, who is actually now back doing things with the community again, but um, the whole incident was not handled particularly well by the Yepige. You know, some ISIS accounts came out, you know, claiming it was theirs as they always do, and that was a convenient thing. And then there were some speculations, which even I uh, was, you know, inclined to believe that, you know, the Yepige, um, you know, it wasn't the Yepige, it was the regime trying to stir up tensions because during this battle, you know, the, you know, Kurdish and Syriac Assyrian communities had, you know, joined forces together to push back a common enemy and the regime was trying to, uh, you know, throw a wrench in that. But n no, it was actually Yepige fighters. Didn't they arrest someone based off of that? It took a hot minute 
yeah. for action to yeah. happen. Uh, you know, I, I really think that, you know, from the get-go, uh, you know, some, like, you know, mid-ranking commanders were implicated, and I think from the get-go, the Yetig knew it was them, but found it convenient to try to play it off as being somebody else because... Wow, does it look bad when Kurds kill Assyrian community leaders? Yeah, especially after the old cooperation in the genocide. You know, it you know really goes back to that because yeah. you know you had you know, Simko Shikak killing the patriarch of the Church of the East under a flag of truce, and you know nobody's going to forget that anytime soon. Uh, but. And then, you know, Yepige, you know, tried to sweep it under the rug, but what happened actually was that. Doranoia stepped up and pushed Yepige and the PYD to actually bring some form of justice uh, to David Jindo. Um, you know, it's it very clearly condemned this as, you know, absolutely an unacceptable attack against, you know, fraternity of peoples um, and you know, really, I think it was because of their intervention that trials were actually put forth. I think four people were eventually, you know, convicted of something with uh, one or two of them getting like the maximum sentence in the, the legal system that's growing there, which is like 20, 25 years. But, you know, on the other hand, you look at instances, you know, there was a time, I think in like 2013, when a Yepige commander was killed uh, in an Arab belt village. Uh, what did they do? They, like, shut down the entire village and, like, you know, went in guns ablaze and ferreted out the people who did it. So it, the same justice was not meted out for David Jindo as would be for a Kurdish commander killed under similar circumstances. But I think it's fair to say in in that space, no, not to be all bidgy bidgy here, but in that space... Uh, in that crazy, you know, situation where these are all battling, I think at least, I mean, I imagine MFS thought, okay, at least they've done something. Yeah, and like, you know, they, they have done something. And MFS, you know, this is one of the instances where they have proved themselves to actually be able to, you know, there there are criticisms of MFS and the Dardanoia more broadly that, you know, that they're just Kurdish puppets. They don't have any mind of their own. They just do what the PKK tells them to do. But this, you know, is in fact not true. They work closely with, you know, you know, PKK umbrella groups. They've always done that, but they are really their own thing. They make their own decisions. Um, they cooperate on joint projects, but they will stand up and uh, advocate for their own interests uh, when it becomes necessary. Sure. Uh, the, the murder of David Jindo then is, I guess, a perfect example of that. Yes, yes. And this is this is even something where you know, David Jindo was not, you know, you know, a Dora Noyo. He was, you know, of the, you know, kind of Khaburi microcosm of politics where you had the Assyrian Democratic Party kind of as the main political representative and he had some involvement with that and he was part of the you know, parallel militia, you know, the Copper Guards. Um, but, you know, MFS saw this happen to, you know, somebody that they regarded as a member of their community, spoke up, and, you know, he's actually now officially commemorated as a martyr of the MFS. And did that, did that strengthen, uh, you know, the MFS coming forward and sorting that out? Did that strengthen ties with the Copper Guards and the MFS? Yeah, I, mean, I would say so. I mean... <clears throat> Yeah, there was a whole fracas there. Um, you had uh, certain diaspora groups, we'll say, who came out with these fabricated statements that they ran through Baptist media saying that the Habar guards were permanently disarming and disbanding in protest of everything, um, which have turned out to be utter nonsense. They're still there, um, you know. But, you know, there is kind of this joint, you know, partial custody arrangement with the MFS, um, which I think is to the benefit of the Khabur Guards. Um, certainly, uh, it's strengthened uh, MFS's standing as a group that can effectively vouch for the concerns of different parts of the community. Um, actually, during the recent Jazeera Storm offensives down in, the, in Deir Zor, um, MFS 
took a prominent role in capturing the town of Busaira, which is at the confluence of the Lower Habor and the Euphrates. Um, and you saw members um, of the MFS posing with uh, a Dauranoya version of the Assyrian national flag. Uh, so with the you know red, white, and blue stripes and the Utu star in the middle, uh, but right above that, in the place where you usually have uh, the Ashur symbol, uh, there was the Dauranoya sun and red star. That's niche, and it's also like you know kind of cool to see. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a show of um, maybe if not you know completely real on the ground, it's at least some show of force, like they're coming together. There are some who would you know object to the. Uh, appropriation of national symbols by political parties. But I think in this case where you have a group that's, you know, most firmly associated these days with, you know, one version of the national identity to see them broadening their, you know, symbology to start incorporating different parts of the community. I think that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. How did the MFS come to fight under the umbrella of the SDF, the, the Syrian Democratic Forces? Because you said earlier that, you know, the Assyrian Syriacs uh, militias were kind of appealing to the US for weapons, as have the YPG. Um, I know they all fought together. What was their role under the SDF? The partnership with, you know, PYD Dauranoi partnership in uh, the Northeast um, was really like the first inter-ethnic partnership that the PYD forged there. And this took place as uh, the Supreme Kurdish Council, as it was called, this kind of really terrible joint uh, governing body with KDP-aligned parties started to disintegrate. Uh, yeah, big, you know, PYD looked around and was like, you know, I think made a very smart decision realizing that just working within the Kurdish community was really going to curtail them given just how ethnically mixed the North is overall. Definitely. I think it's very pragmatic of them as well, you know. Yeah, I, you know, I honestly, you know, personally of, of the opinion, you know, good riddance to the Enikese, the Kurdish National Council pro-KDP, I think cutting them off and letting them go com complain in uh, Erbil hotels. Yeah, this is the so-called Raj Peshmerga, right? E-N-K-S in, you know, uh, anglicized... They, they, they went on to attack PKK, YPG proxies, even in Sinjar, you know, so I, I think you're right there. I think it was a good idea. And, you know, now they're being used to occupy Assyrian villages in the Nineveh plains, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a grand disaster, and it's great that they're not there anymore. And so, you know, I think the, the PYD strategy of forging inter-ethnic alliances has been immensely successful, and the great granddaddy of all of these is the one with Daranoia. Um, and... You know, that started happening in mid-2013 when Sutoro, S-U Toro, started popping up in these towns. Um, and, you know, they dress the same as Asayish, they have the same patches, they have their own training academies, um, but they're all kind of integrate. you know, they have been from the get-go really integrated within the broader security apparatus even before the SDF umbrella was conceived. So it just made sense when SDF came out. It was like, obviously, there are guys that are coming in with us. Yeah, yeah. You know, as, as like, you know, the first other partner, like, of course, they're going to be joining. Sure. And w what kind of um, role do they play in the actual battles that f the, the SDF fought? So earlier on, uh, they were kind of mostly, uh, you know, checkpoint people. Um, the Epige has, you know, tended to lean most heavily on uh, more committed, better trained, uh, some, you know, guerrilla influence uh, in their Kurdish units. You know, these are the ones that they have traditionally pushed to the front line because they can be counted on to fight the hardest. But, um, you know, over time, you know, more and more experience was gained by these other groups, among them MFS. Um, and... You know, they kind of had their baptism of fire in the uh, in the defense of the Khabur villages. Um, and then, you know, they sent delegations to pretty much every uh, offensive since then and uh, took a pretty prominent role, actually, for their small size. It was, you know, maybe 30, 40 people in total, including uh, their women's wing fighting in Raqqa. Um, 
Yeah, I was going to ask about Raqqa because I saw quite a lot of footage at the time where, you know, MFS seemed to be taking a real role. They weren't just staring into the distance at dusty checkpoints. They were kind of, you know, on the front line. Um, ISIS were very close. The proximity was the very front. Um, so how did that happen? How did they become key fighters in that position? Yeah, I mean, you know, they gained little bits of experience uh, fighting in the battles prior. Uh, they developed their training uh, courses more and more. Um, and, you know, eventually, you know, they were allowed to take positions on the very front lines, which, you know, everybody I've talked to has said that, yeah, you know, MFS, they weren't many of them in Raqqa, but they were like on the front of the front. Um, they also seem to be doing a lot of like drone related stuff from what they were posting on social media, which I think is pretty cool. Drone related how surveillance or those little kind of mortar drone bombs that they've been using? Uh, it seemed to be mostly surveillance uh, from the stuff they were posting, but uh, you know, Harbour Guards actually sent um, their own delegation to Raqqa, but I think it was mostly kind of a checkpoint deal. They didn't spend too much time there. They've always kind of been a little less trained and organized than MFS has aspired to be. So that all kind of makes sense. I saw some footage the other day there, you know, you mentioned as well they're in Diazor now. Why are they there? What, what specifically is there for them? You know, Assyria, Syria, Kaldi, and why would they be going to Diazor? As it would turn out, uh, you know, when ISIS kind of crashed into Sinjar uh, and, you know, into the Nineveh Plains in 2014, a lot of attention was on um, the mass kidnapping and rape and enslavement of Yazidis. Um, however, at the same time, a number of Christians were kidnapped from the villages there um, in Nineveh Plains. Um, and just the other day, actually, um, a woman, I think either from Bartila or Bakhtida, uh, was rescued from a village in the lower uh, Euphrates area by MFS. Uh, so there, there still are these kidnapped members of the community out there at large. Um, and it's, it's also about, you know, just making a statement to the world that, you know, the Assyrian Syriac community is here, is fighting to, you know, cleanse their homelands of, you know, this evil force that has come in for a nation that exists mostly in diaspora these days to have that kind of, you know, very prominent, uh, this, this display of strength in the homeland that's a significant and meaningful thing. And, you know, overall, you know, the population of Christians in Iraq and in Syria has continued to dwindle uh, as this latest round of conflicts has rolled across the region. Um, and a lot of that is just a continuation and deepening of prior trends of emigration. Um, a lot of folks don't really see a whole lot of the future in an unstable region where they're living kind of in these villages. You know, they already have cousins in Germany or in Sweden or in, uh, you know, you know, the States or Australia, um, you know, much better opportunities there, why stay? Um, we haven't spoken about the, you know, so-called Christian militias in Iraq, because I think that's where a lot of people hear from them. For example, there is, you know, the MPU, the MPF, Dweck Norsha. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the, those groups within Iraq? Yeah, so this, this is a whole uh, other universe, really. Um, um, I'm going to launch into this by saying that, you know, when I've talked with uh, certain people affiliated with the Daranoia and asked, like, what's up with Iraq, you know, in comparison to Syria, like, it seems kind of a mess there. And, you know, the, the sentiment is that we don't want Syria to look like Iraq, like the, this, the really fractured situation there is kind of a worst case scenario. Um, so uh, the most significant militia, I will say, is the uh, Nineveh Plain Protection Units, the NPU. Uh, these are affiliated to the Assyrian Democratic Movement, uh, ZOA, uh, which um, traces its origin actually to, um, it, it fought alongside uh, the Peshmerga 
uh, against the Ba'athist regime in the north. Um, and of course, the Syrian villages were also targeted in, in the Anfal campaign. In the uh, post-2003 era, uh, ADM has uh, really uh, fallen out with the KDP in the broader scene in the KRG. Um, and their program is uh, they want to <coughs> create a new Iraqi province in the Nineveh Plains to act as, you know, a you know, quasi-autonomous homeland uh, for Assyrians and other minorities in the plains under the auspices of a pluralist Iraqi state rather than being, you know, quote-unquote Kurdish Christians under uh, an, a domineering KRG. And so in, in 2014, when uh, ISIS rolled in, they took a number of Assyrian towns um, in the plains. The Peshmerga, as they did in um, Sinjar, kind of, you know, took their weapons, ran back to some defensive lines. Uh, and I mean, the, the Iraqi army did the same, but they were just kind of facing a more systemic collapse. It was... Um, yeah, not a great time to be living in that area. I spoke to a Shia Kurd, actually, in a refugee camp uh, outside Erbil a few years ago, and she was from Bartella. She said the exact same thing. She said, like, every, they all just absolutely legged it. I remember her saying she kind of felt that we, didn't, we weren't as important to them as perhaps other areas, you know? And she was a Shia Kurd. She wasn't even a Syrian or Syriac, but, of course, you know, had a lot of ties to the community there. Yeah, I mean... You know, the, the conflict against ISIS, I think, has really, with the whole pose referendum madness, has really um, put to rest uh, any notions that uh, the Peshmerga of today are the brave, same brave lions who uh, squared off against the Ba'athist army. But that's, that, that's kind of beside the point. Uh, so, you know, back to the whole militia scene there, you have the NPU, which is um, officially kind of a, a franchise of the, uh, the PMU. Sure, the popular mobilization units. Uh, you know, slurred lar uh, largely as Shia militias, but also including, you know, Yazidi and Assyrian uh, components. Uh, the NPU, like, really isn't tied to the Shia side of things and actually has some tensions there, but they are officially under those auspices because, again, they see working under a federal Iraq as being their best chance of getting the autonomy that they want. Um, on the other side, you have the Kurdish-backed scene. The, the KDP in particular runs a lot of patronage policies with the Assyrian community uh, in their areas. Um, bankrolling political parties to square off against ADM. And so, sorry, remind me, ADM is what, sorry? Is uh, the Assyrian Democratic Movement, uh, also known as ZOA, you know, kind of the granddaddy of Assyrian nationalist parties in Iraq. So there are a couple militias. There's like the Nineveh Plain Guard Forces, which are absolutely marginal. There's Dwef Nausha, which are attached to some other, you know, client um, and are mostly known for attracting uh, these kind of doomsday Christian fundamentalists uh, from the West. Um, and then you have the NPF, which are um, actually connected to uh, the Dauranoye. It's kind of a problematic thing given, you know, they are working with KDP Peshmerga and KDP Peshmerga have a pretty bad name. Um, in the community, uh, so it, it it draws a bit of fire. So the MPF is the they're Nineveh Plains forces, aren't they? Yeah, they're mostly around like Tesklopa, um not terribly large uh, from everything I've seen, but you know they're there, they're backed by the uh, the KDP, um, and you know, are one of many sources of frustration for the NPU as they seek to become uh, the sole guardian of, um, you know, the Assyrian population of the Nineveh Plains. Um, and then meanwhile, you actually have some other competing units on the PMU side. Um, one of them most well-known is the Babylon Brigades, headed by a guy, Rayan al-Kiltani, um, Chaldean guy. Uh, 
they're actually mostly um, Shabaks and Shia Arabs, um, not very many Christians at all amongst them, and they have actually clashed with uh, the NPU um, over local control. Clashed militarily? I mean, it wasn't like a full-on battle, but some scuffles broke out. Baghdad came down on the side of the NPU, actually. Um, but these days, they're mostly, uh, the Babylon brigades are mostly in Tel Kepe, um, so kind of northish of Mosul. So they're just kind of sitting around right now, I imagine. Yeah, and just really not being a productive contributor to the scene there because, you know, they're not really, a, you know, they're nominally a Christian militia, but they're not actually, like, you know, most of their strength is drawn from other communities. And then there, there's this somewhat more obscure uh, branch of the PMU, um, vaguely associated with the Babylon Brigades, who, but also kind of their own thing, the Syriac Hawks, um, because there are a couple, like, Syriac Orthodox and Catholic villages in the plains, and the church does kind of push that identity. The Syriac Hawks, what are they up to? Uh, not a whole lot from what I can tell. This is a very, very marginal fraction. Um, they seem to have some earlier roots in um, an outfit that uh, sprang up alongside, I think, the Imam Ali brigades um, earlier, but then rebranded themselves. Uh, even in these, like, you know, splinter parties, you find maddening complexity. Yeah, so I think, you know, a very good friend of mine, Kurdish friend of mine, says, oh, you know, Kurds worse than any of the Kurds. I think in the Iraqi Christian militia group, so-called Christian militia group, they're definitely their very own worst enemy. They seem to be fighting in all different, you know, fractured states. Yeah, I, I will say that, like, some of the internal fighting is because, uh, you know, certain people, parties, interests are paid off by the KDP. So there is kind of this, you know, it's not a, you know, doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, it, it's not just internal feuding, like some of it is backed by outside interests. What role do the Syriac, you know, Assyrian, Chaldean militias in Iraq play? Because I remember for a while, all they seemed to do was, you know, smoke cigarettes, drink chai and kind of man various sandbags here and there. Um, but then I saw the, uh, I think it was the Nineveh Plains Protection Units actually retake a few towns with the help of the Iraqi army when the Mosul operation started. Um, so maybe you can tell me what, what role do they play militarily? Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong in saying that a lot of what happens is just like, kicking your feet up on the sandbags and smoking cigarettes. And that's especially the case of some of the more uh, marginal client militias. Um, NPU is definitely the most serious out of all of them. You know, they're actively built, busy, you know, building new training bases, recruiting new members, cooperating with, uh, you know, their aim is really to provide a kind of stable and unified security that will facilitate the return of people who fled. So they, they have, you know, they did participate in some of the uh, liberation operations alongside uh, Iraqi army PMU. And, you know, Babylon brigades and the Syriac Hawks also had some footage of participation, but I think it was, again, less serious than the NPU. They're also in Bartella, um, Karamlash, uh, and are looking, you know, their main area of conflict and friction right now is um, in Tel Kepe, which is occupied by the Babylon Brigades, but which KDP is trying to, like, do, pol or prior to the referendum, I'll say, had been, you know, through control of the provincial council, had tried to oust the ADM mayor um, and did actually oust him. Um, and they did the same thing in al Kosh to the north which is actually properly under Peshmerga control and has seen popular demonstrations against that. In advance of the referendum, you know, KDP was really trying to force on as many of these disputed border areas as they could. Um, and ADM and NPU were the ones, you know, most vocally standing up to that. So is it unfair to say, do you think, that the Assyrians uh, in northern Iraq benefited from the kind of destruction of the KRG via Kirkuk and the referendum? Um, 
so, you know, as, you know, the Peshmerga were, you know, retreating from Kirkuk or retreating from Sinjar, from, you know, the Rabia area and, you know, finally getting pushed up to like the Peshkabur crossing, um, the, there was, were wide speculations that they would just like pack up and leave from some of these Assyrian towns as well. But that's not what happened. Um, they dug in, they, you know, brought in, you know, the Rojava Peshmerga to help them man the defensive lines. And while they, you know, didn't make a stand again for, you know, Sinjar, which has been, you know, such a, you know, hugely emotional and controversial issue within the Kurdish scene, they made absolutely no attempt to hold on to that. They are still, you know, have this death grip on, um... Uh, some of the Assyrian towns of Nineveh Plains. Um, and there had been kind of hope that, you know, Baghdad would, you know, push harder to expel them from these areas, but that's not really panned out so far. I would say on balance, um, yes, you know, this situation is better than it was, you know, leading into the referendum. Um, but it's not great either. Uh, there is still the lingering issue of KRG control of, uh, you know, several towns in the area and not wanting to give them up. And Baghdad seems to now be, you know, not as interested in um, pushing to retake these. And then you also have, you know, problems with, you know, other militias kind of, want, you know, particularly, you know, some of these Shia PMU outfits wandering around in you know, causing trouble, uh, you know, putting up, uh, you know, spooky religious imagery around Christian towns. Um, I mean, would, would, would Baghdad really treat them any better? Like if, if, you know, if everything really crumbled and the whole area was in control of Iraq properly, um, would they really treat them any better, do you think? I, I'm not going to say I'm convinced that they're, they would treat them like, great. I will say that Baghdad has made, like, noises that in the past and recently that it will grant some wishes to, um, you know, Assyrians and other minorities in the area. And I think that, you know, against the backdrop of trying to further curtail uh, KRG power, there is a case that if you can, you know, get the longer-term loyalty of the population of Nineveh Plains, um, and in exchange, like, just let them run their own affairs, uh, you know, that's a better option than leaving it up to KRG control, where I think, you know, KRG just wants total central control over the area. Bazanistan. Basically. I wanted to ask you about Dweck Norsha, because they are a very interesting group, and as you kind of mentioned a little bit, um, you do kind of get these, I think you said doomsday Christian types. And I've seen so many, well, not so many, but quite a lot of foreign Western volunteers joining Dwek Norsha. And a lot of them are like far right or part of very unusual Knights Templar kind of organizations. What is it that draws these kind of people to uh, Dwek Norsha, do you think? So, you know, I, I, on the, you know, just militia level, I think there is, you know, probably they just have really lax standards for the people that they let in. I mean, Yepige in Syria has had issues, you know, earlier on with just having utter loons come in, like, you know, even had, like, neo-Nazis trying to come join this leftist outfit in northern Syria. It was nuts. Dwek Nausha, I think, are, like, really not a particularly significant force as far as militias go. A lot of it is just this, like, you know, it's taken on this, like, symbolic value as being, like, you know, the convergence point for uh, right-wingers and fundamentalists. And I think this, again, circles back on, you know, why I think uh, the term Christian militias insofar... I mean, like, you know, I will use the, the terminology sometimes, um, but... You know, it's. It, I think it's important to remember at all times that it's kind of a problematic thing to be applying to, at the very least, the you know Assyrian scene, um, because it erases the you know national question um, out of it, which is hugely important, and also kind of turns it into a focal point for 
just loons from the West, um, you know, who see, you know, yes, you know, Assyrians are Christians and, you know, they are, you know, imperiled in uh, their homeland. Um, and, uh, you know, the left, I think, does a really terrible job across the board at, you know, just recognizing first off that these people exist. Um, whereas, you know, this Christian marker is just like, you know, flies to honey for uh, these right wing types. Um, and so they, you know, you get these people who have, you know, bad experiences serving in, you know, Western militaries in the region and they want to come back and, you know, fight against the, you know, jihadis, you know, and, oh, look, there's these, you know, Christians, we can help the, you know, you know, we're persecuted Christians too. I think it really, like, especially with these right-wing types, like, centers, circles back on this perception that, you know, Euro-white Western Christians, you know, of certain persuasions feel themselves to also be, you know, quote-unquote, persecuted in the West, which I think is a little... I think it's a total stretch. Um, but, you know, they find in Middle Eastern Christian communities who are very legitimately persecuted and endangered, you know, confirmation that, you know, Christians all over, including us, are persecuted, so we're going to stand together here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there was one guy I saw, which I think sums up your point. Um, I saw one guy, he, he got sent over there by this bizarre kind of christian orthodox order called the aura 777 and they were kind of linked to bravik and all sorts of weird stuff and you know he was screaming about oh, persecution here in england blah 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 meanwhile you get sent to somewhere where people's churches are literally being burnt down by jihadists you know it's not quite the same thing as oh sorry they you know took baby jesus off of the christmas card or whatever you can't make a comparison between the two i think these are, you know, in the Middle East, these are communities which, you know, they're looking for, you know, just people who will help them out. So, they're, yeah, they're, like, I think that's a good point to make, though, because it's not like we're saying, oh, Dwight Norsha are all far right or anybody that joins Dwight Norsha are far right. But, you know, I can understand if they're like, hey, we're from the West, we'll bring you good PR, we want to fight with you. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you even had, like, you know, the Hungarian government right now, you know, known for its push of, you know, this, you know, Christian identitarian whatever thing, um, actually, you know, sending, you know, a decent chunk of change to help reconstruct uh, villages in Nineveh Plains. So, you know, there, there's this kind of saying that, you know, Middle Eastern Christians are, uh, you know, too Christian to excite the left and, you know, too foreign to excite the right. I think that's kind of, you know, true up to a point, but I really do think that, uh, you know, while the left absolutely drops the ball when it comes to Middle Eastern Christians, the right actually is doing things. It's, you know, sending money, it's doing organizing. It's not always, you know, in my opinion, with the purest of interest, but like, hey, look, they're actually doing something. So. And I don't think either that people are quite understanding how I don't know, in, in Europe, especially with, you know, I hate to say it, populism and whatever, there are a lot of these kind of uh, Eastern European Balkan groups who have, you know, a lot of communication or at least solidarity with these groups in the Middle East, which, you know, <laughs> can be dangerous, especially when they start wanting to get militant, you know? They're, you know, amongst, like, you know, political parties of, like, the Assyrian Syriacs, and a lot of them just do, like, you know, automatically try to seek out, like, Western right-wingers, but that's largely because, I mean, like, you know, they, they, they do tend to be a little religiously conservative themselves, but they just know that, you know, these people are going to be like, ah, yes, the persecuted Christians of the Middle East will come right in. Whereas with, you know, the left, you know, you oftentimes have to start with explaining that, like, no, not all people in the Middle East are Arabs and not all of them are Muslims. And yes, Islamophobia and anti-Arab sentiment in the West is a problem, but you need to actually recognize that the Middle East has a very diverse and varied history and that within the middle eastern context christians are relatively dis you know historically disempowered and persecuted and that's you know the reality within the region and i think a lot of leftists like to transpose just you know what they see the situation in the west is as just being what it is everywhere across the world
a lot of leftists just want to stand on a protest with a Palestine flag, you know, and wear a kafaya in the winter, just so everybody knows how fucking edgy they are. But, you know, like you said, there are these very serious communities out there, um, which I guess uh, brings me to ask, like, what do you think is going to happen in the future to the, you know, the Syriacs, the Chaldeans, the Assyrians, because they've gone through massive change with the wars, uh, specifically in Syria? I mean, if you look at the broad sweep of the history of this nation, um, it's a long and gripping story of like survival and preservation. Um, and so I do think that the community will continue to exist as such for some time to come. They're heavily, you know, still in diaspora, maintain a decent bit of communal life, even though, as often happens, the language is starting to rust away. Um, I think there will, you know, it's, it hinges on um, how stable the security that has been brought to northeast Syria and uh, northern Iraq as ISIS has been pushed out, um, how stable that turns out to be. Um, if, you know, Democratic Federation of Northern Syria turns out to be a long-term, uh, you know, lasting entity, I think that, uh, you know, you will see, you know, an enduring presence in the homeland of these communities. You know, a lot of people have left because of the war, but as things wind down, um, and if a livable arrangement is reached, uh, you know, you, you'll start to see some people coming back. Probably not all of them, but some. Um, and, you know, likewise with Nineveh Plains, although I think the situation there is a little more up in the air. Um, but, you know, for example, if Turkey were to have its way and, you know, forcibly dismantle the federal project in northern Syria. Also known as Rojava. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that would be calamitous. Um, and likewise, I also think if um, large-scale uh, clashes uh, broke out between uh, the SDF and uh, Syrian Arab army, uh, especially in the, you know, remaining enclaves that the regime has in um, northeast Syria, uh, I think that could also be very dangerous. And I think if, you know, the regime were to start trying to advance in Jazeera, um, you would see a lot of communal tensions flame up uh, and it would be, it, it would be, it would be dark. Um, but for right now, um, you know, in Gozarto, Jazeera, Northeast Syria, you're actually seeing, you know, for the first time, education being done in Syriac outside of the churches. Uh, previously had been kind of the policy that all, you know, public schooling, you know, that had to be Arabic. Uh, you know, Kurds were not allowed to really learn their language anywhere other but anywhere else but the home, and there were other restrictions on it uh, because the Ba'ath had kind of, uh, you know, patronage arrangement with elements of the Syriac Assyrian community. Uh, they left a little more leeway for the teaching of the language, but it had to be within kind of more of a, a parochial church context. Um, but now, you know, you're actually seeing, you know, a more vigorous identity and effort to preserve and promote the culture going on um, in the federal project. You know, you see... You know, Syriac script on like all the official emblems and the SDF flag and everything. There, there are still suspicions. There are still a lot of pro-regime uh, elements of the community, but I think generally people just kind of want to get on with their lives. Um, so, barring the outbreak of conflict, uh, we could actually see the uh, the realization of the. Uh, regional autonomy movement that happened uh, during the French mandate uh, featuring cooperation between uh, Kurdish and um, mostly Syriac Catholic at the time, but Syriac leaders um, ultimately failed because of Arab nationalism taking over. But now, you know, almost a century later, they've, you know, the communities are able to assert their own identity 
free of any restrictions in their own homes. Sure. And w- one last thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, the kind of Assyrian, Syriac or Christian or whatever uh, influences on the regime side. For example, like, what is it? The Syrian Social Nationalist Party, the SSMP, that weird far right group. They're all Christians, right? And quite hardcore at that. And they fight for Assad. So what kind of, what groups, I guess, are fighting under Assad and how important are they? So um, SSMP is actually religiously mixed. Oh, it is. Oh, my bad. It, it has its strongest spaces in uh, Christian communities. Some of them are um, of, like, Syriac denominations, but you also have, like, Melkite Catholics, um, other, you know, Orthodox groups, um, and some Sunnis who generally live close to these uh, these Christian communities. Um but, I mean, the, the church hierarchies in general, even like the Syriac Orthodox Church, which is headquartered in Damascus, uh, tend to be more behind the regime than they are with, uh, like, the federal project. Although they do show up and, like, you know, several members of SUP Sutoro were actually killed defending the uh, Mor Afram, the patriarch of the Syriac Orthodox Church, from a bomb attack in Kamishli. Uh, but so in the West of Syria where the regime has more, uh, freedom to operate, um, you get these, you know, militias in some of the villages in, in Hama or around Damascus. Um, as you said, probably the most far reaching one is the SSNP's, uh, party militia, uh, like the Tornado Eagles, um, whirlwind eagle something like that yeah that weird swastika slash eagle logo they have yeah it's it's something else it's really something else yeah so ssmp has styled itself these days as kind of like loyal opposition um to the bath so like they're not the bath they will say things that are slightly different from the Ba'ath, but they're for the Ba'ath. This is a party that has, like, several decades worth of history. It fought in the Lebanese Civil War. It has branches in Lebanon. Fighters from Lebanon have served in Syria. Um, so it is, it's kind of its its own thing, really. Um, more, you know, party militia sort of stuff. So they've kind of come to Assad's aid in the way that Hezbollah have. Uh, they're less strong than Hezbollah, but they have, um, so ISIS has attacked on a couple occasions, uh, several Christian, actually, I think Syriac Orthodox villages, uh, in the kind of desert borderlands, uh, south of Homs. So Sadad, Mahin, and Tariatain. uh, SSNP deployed to those areas, uh, when they were under attack. And interestingly enough, Su Toro, the Kamishli group, um, was flown out on Russian planes from Kamishli to fight alongside SSNP. And this, this actually happened after the GPF brand emerged, and a lot of, like, you know, pro-regime news were uh, reporting it as GPF, but if you look at the pictures of uh, the, the fighters who went out there, they were mostly wearing the uh, gold, red, and blue Sutoro eagle patches, uh, which are more the Syriac Arameanist identity, um, which, you know, makes some sense in that, you know, these villages are Syriac in terms of their church affiliation, but um, culturally Arab, and so have a little less to do with the uh, like a Syrian political scene, if that makes any sense. Yeah, definitely, definitely, it does make sense. Uh, do you know what, Hans? I think we've got it. You know, I think we've got it. It's been really, really interesting, man. All right, sounds good.